can we start to set some audacious goals around enabling as many people as possible on the planet to live a long, healthy life, creating an atmosphere of shared prosperity? And what is the role of AI in doing that? To me, these big societal narratives should be at the, at the top level of abstraction in terms of what we're talking about. And then everything else is derived from that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello, and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. Today on the show, we're joined by Ashley Lawrence. Ashley is a scientist and engineer with a 20-year career in research and development of AI technologies at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and he recently joined Microsoft Research. Ashley is also a hip-hop artist known as Solstice, and one of his songs was actually featured in the Oscar-nominated film, The Blind Side. So I know there are a lot of theories out there about why so many scientists are awesome musicians, and there's this whole part about music being mathematical and scientists being good at recognizing the rules of music composition, but I'm curious what you think, Kevin. Well, you know, I think... It's one of those mysterious things because you are absolutely right. There are a lot of programmers and computer scientists who seem to have serious interests in music. Um, but I, I, I don't know many of them who are so serious about their music that they have a real recording career. Uh, and like, I think that is one of the things that makes – one of many things that makes Ashley special – no, without a doubt. And I can't wait to hear you both talk about his various areas of expertise and kind of these dueling careers. So let's chat with Ashley. Our guest today is Ashley Lawrence. Ashley is a scientist, engineer, and hip-hop artist. He worked for two decades at John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, developing novel AI technologies, and served as founding chief of the lab's Intelligent Systems Center. He was recently nominated by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to serve as an AI expert for the Global Partnership on AI. Besides his career in engineering, Ashley actually began his career as a hip-hop artist and serves as a voting member of the Recording Academy for the Grammy Awards. About a month ago, Ashley joined Microsoft as a vice president, distinguished scientist, and managing director for Microsoft Research. Welcome to the show, Ashley, and to Microsoft. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kevin. Great to be here. Uh, so, so awesome to have you here, uh, have you here at Microsoft. So, um, we, we always start these podcasts by talking a little bit about where you got started. Um, so I, I know you grew up in Chicago. Um, how did you get interested in, uh, like, I guess, either music or technology? Yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll, we'll go in order uh, and I can just kind of create two contrasting scenes for you. So, you know, my interest in, in music you know, growing up in Chicago, South Side of Chicago, South Suburbs, um, just really immersed in music. Uh, you, you know, um, th throughout throughout my childhood, and hip hop in particular was always fascinating to me. Um, just the degree of storytelling, uh, you know, the beats, the sounds. Uh, growing up in the kind of uh, you know East Coast vibes, listening to artists like Nas, uh, West Coast uh, artists as well. And it was, you know, it came, it, it grew to be something that, you know, I went from being a fan of to something I really wanted to contribute to, uh, especially as I was sort of coming of age and, and wanting to express myself. So, you know, the, the challenge with the, you know, where we grew up and everything was we didn't really have uh, many outlets for that energy at first, you know, and so we did what we could, you know, we uh, it, it just, just kind of put a visual in your head. We would go to, you know, like the, what was it, Circuit City at the time or what have you. We, we had like a boom box with two tape decks 
And that was the recording studio. And we were so proud of ourselves because we figured out how to do multi-layer vocals with a $20 mic and the two tape decks. You know, you record on the one tape and then you play it back and record over yourself and, you know, over some instrumental, you get the multi-track vocals. So that was like our, you know, $75 studio setup. And so, you know, and it, and it just kind of kind of grew from there. Um, and, you know, the, the, the contrasting scene, and of course we can come back to like the career trajectories and things, but the contrasting picture that I'd love to paint is just around, um, you know, kind of the intellectual curiosity that was really uh, a family value for us. And, um, you know, really um, both of my parents were teachers. My dad introduced me to two things early in life that really shaped my curiosity. One being uh, theoretical physics, <laughs> you know, I was quite young reading books by like Michio Kaku and not really understanding what string theory was, but really just being fascinated by it. And then Marvel Comics was the other thing. Um, and, you know, just really, uh, you know, the Infinity Gauntlet, something that's been a, a, a topic of conversation within our family for a few decades. <laughs> uh, so it was great to see it on on the screen. And so, you know, I just was really driven by a curiosity of understanding how the world works. Again, not as much of an outlet for that curiosity. And, and that brings me to a story about outlets. You know, I actually ran uh, one of my first electrical engineering experiments by peeling the paper off of a twist tie and then sticking it into an electrical outlet um, <laughs> just to see what would happen. You know, so so really you had these these two scenes uh, kind of unfolding. And you know, I say sharing some of the same fundamental motivations, you know, um, driven by uh, curiosity, uh, passion for understanding people and technology and and really um, grew to you know, passion for having an impact on the world in, the, in these two different ways. Yeah, it's so interesting um, that so many of the people that we chat with who have these large creative appetites, they're sort of creative across a whole bunch of different dimensions, like have that grounded in curiosity, um, you know, just this sort of voracious uh curiosity about how the world works and like why things are the way that they are. I mean, it's really funny, this electrical outlet uh, story. Uh, like I did exactly the same thing when I was four <laughs> years old. Uh, I don't nice. think it was, a twi it wasn't a twist tie, but, uh, and I forget what I jabbed in it, but I, I remember my mother uh, screaming when, uh, <laughs> you know, there was this loud <laughs> crack and, uh, you know, her child was crying. Uh, and, uh, you know, th that, that sort of fearlessness that accompanies uh, the curiosity, I think, is, uh, I, you know, curiosity strikes me as something that you can certainly cultivate, but, uh, you know, it's hard to create when it's not there. Whereas I do think fearlessness, uh, like you can sort of work really hard to become more, more fearless and like part of how fearless you can be uh, is your environment. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really it's really interesting, um, and I'm always I'm always careful not to take too much credit for a lot of just the things that come naturally. Uh, I feel really fortunate, uh, you know, to have these kind of fundamental drives and everything. I think as as children, you know, we're sort of naturally driven by our curiosity and to explore, and uh, you know, the outlet story is a, a great kind of illustration of that. I think. As adults, a lot of times, if you if you're not careful, um, the world will cause you to unlearn uh, some of those fundamental drives and and you know being, you know. So I think part part of the part of the the thing that I've learned is to just allow myself to be driven by my curiosity, um, and to and to behave fearlessly in that way, and to ask questions and and not be afraid to fail. And I think. Uh, part of what I'm grateful for is just that I've managed not to unlearn those things as an adult, uh, to kind of just behave childishly in that respect, uh, yeah. at this point in my life. And so was your, was your dad a physics professor? He was a math teacher, uh, just with, with, a with just a, a passion for, uh, math and science, but he has a high school math teacher and a track coach. That's awesome. So awesome. So, you know, like, I, I'm just sort of curious, like when you uh, when you stuck that uh, stripped wire tie uh, into into the socket, like what did your parents do? You know, um, I kind of got away with it. 
nobody was really around. And uh, I was just, it, it was a, it was an immediate kind of fascination with the, you know, kind of the explosion and the smoke, the little mini explosion in the smoke that happened. And then an overwhelming sense of guilt <laughs> that I kind of carried. <laughs> uh, and, and I, you know, I don't know if they're listening to this uh, podcast at some point, they may be surprised to learn that this was an experiment that I conducted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, you know, we, we were talking about this on the last episode of the podcast uh, with uh, Jacob Collier, who's also a musician who uses uh, technology in interesting ways. And, um, you know, one of the one of the things that we were talking about is how you preserve the f fearlessness when people are making themselves vulnerable by exploring and having having an environment like whether it's your parents when you're a kid or you know a, a set of colleagues or peers or your company or your institution that helps you you know that, that doesn't give you uh you know just sort of uncritical positive feedback like that's almost as bad as uh you know just overwhelmingly negative feedback but they can figure out how to strike that line between you know sort of saying wow this is awesome that you are uh you're exploring this curiosity but uh you know like here's some things that could be better but like man you should be really proud of yourself for pushing in this way like is that something that you got as a child or like something that you had to learn over time or it's a great question i think a lot about that um as a parent you know of my own children uh, but also in terms of leadership, you know, in a technology, uh, science and technology organization. But yeah, as a kid, you know, I mentioned this kind of intellectual curiosity as a family value. Um, I, I never really got the sense that I was asking too many questions or that stupid questions were a bad thing. Um, I thought my parents did a really good job of creating that kind of environment for us. I try to do the same for my kids. Uh, you know, I just get really used to saying, that's a great question. Uh, you know, and just just encouraging the asking of questions and entertaining the questions. And it's hard because, um, you know, uh, there is a such thing as uh, boundaries that you have to try to enforce as well. There is a such thing as, um, you know, what I say is going to go now, even though I've entertained, <laughs> you know, your thoughts and things. So, you know, I, I strike in the right balance there. But, you know, just like, you know, I try to do for my kids. I try to create that environment in a professional setting as well, always leading with, man, that's a fantastic question. Let's take some time to explore that. Let's make sure we hear everybody's conflicting viewpoints before we go forward. But I say in a similar way, you, you do have to kind of set a direction and go eventually. So it's that, you know, striking that balance. Yeah. Well, and, and it's sort of like the two stages, I think, of creativity in a group, like, you know, making sure that you hear everyone's voice and everyone feels free to be bold in their thinking, uh, even when they're vulnerable, uh, like super important. But like, then you have to make a decision. Like we uh, we called it at LinkedIn, uh, disagree and commit. Uh, yeah, so it's perfectly fine to disagree. But at some point, like you have to make a choice about what you're going to do. And then everybody needs to commit to doing that. Uh and, and not be, commit. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you know, you you have like all of this stuff that you are curious about as uh, as a kid. Um, what what's your school look like? Do you, did you have a strong music program, strong science program? Like who who is helping you explore these things that you're super interested in? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I try not to get too much into like local politics, but the way that school systems, uh, school districts work uh, in Illinois, where I'm from, is that one set of schools uh, is supported by the tax base around it. Uh, and it's not necessarily like a shared set of resources across schools. So you have big inequities, uh, you know, in right. terms of the level of resources. And so I went to a school on the lower end of that spectrum. Um, just from a resourcing standpoint. Uh, so that was always a challenge. Like as I was leaving the school, it's better now, but as I was leaving the school, it was in the process of like losing its sports programs, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to, to debts and things like that. So, so that was a tough environment. I would say I was still really fortunate um, to have some great role models. Uh, my math teacher, uh, Mr. Amaro, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go ahead and call, call out the name, um, was really uh, just a great, 
champion and would push us hard. You know, he was this uh, gentleman of Cuban descent that was, you know, from Florida and spoke with an accent, but was always positive. He would wake up, he would get to school at like 6.30 in the morning and, and would expect you to be there at that time, you know, if we were, you were participating on his math team, uh, which I did. So, uh, you know, there was my Spanish teacher and the, the principal that, you know, I got a chance to work with at student government. So, you know, I, I would say maybe even in an environment that was sort of resource constrained like that, uh, I think it's possible to have, uh, you know, some fantastic role models. So I, I feel uh, fortunate there. And so when you when you were thinking about going to college and in college, like how did you choose what to do since you oh. had so many things you were interested in? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because when I think back to high school and this, because you're not really choosing a career at that point, you're choosing a major. And so you find yourself in the guidance counselor's office and it's like, hey, if you're smart, you do math or science. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not sure that that's the right answer necessarily, but that's definitely uh, a prevailing wind, I felt. Um, so it, it felt somehow more pragmatic to me to pursue that aspect just from a career standpoint. So I wound up uh, and it also um, jived with a lot of the kind of intellectual curiosity um, that I mentioned. But I sort of have always stubbornly refused to, to give up the creative aspects as well. And so I took narrative writing courses and, um, you know, a lot of courses on the creativity side, too. I, I probably would have had a minor in those things if the engineering school had allowed it. Um, and I'd say that kind of duality tracked me, you know, into my career. So if you fast forward a bit uh, to 2003, I was kind of graduating from graduate school and starting a record label at the same time. Um, and my plan was to uh, just move into science and technology long enough to fund a record label and then leave and go do music full time. Because even having advanced to that point, you know, after having gone through undergrad and, and kind of got my master's and all, I still didn't really believe that a career in, in engineering was for me. Like I didn't have very many role models that were professional engineers and scientists, so I wasn't really sure. Um, if it was a place that I could kind of be myself, you know, uh, be intellectually curious and, and be entrepreneurial and kind of have an impact on my own terms. Those things were very important to me. So, uh, you know, so I kind of set off and I, what I found was, first of all, the opportunity to do both. So I kind of hung on to those things for as long as I could. For a good 10 years, I was doing uh, doing both things. And on the music side just figuring out how to press records, vinyl records, and how to get my records into places like clubs in Tokyo, and then how to get myself into places like clubs in Tokyo to, uh, you know, to do performances. And it kind of took me around the world and uh, many adventures. But, you know, on a parallel path, I was really figuring out how to chart my own course within science and technology, how to be myself in doing those things, um, and really discovering a kind of really cool career path right at the intersection of science and engineering and having opportunities to be a principal investigator, uh, even as a fairly young scientist, you know, uh, you know, from, for the Office of Naval Research and, and other sponsors. Um, so publishing, you know, do, so if you think science, you know, engineering and music, so publishing papers and academic conferences, um, going to uh, flying overseas to do those conferences, but then leaving the poster session to go do a show at the club, you know, presenting a, a research in Prague and then doing a show in Prague, <laughs> you know, and then eventually, um, you know, uh, being able to turn a lot of those scientific advancements into real world technologies for the Navy and other sponsors. So just a, a tremendous set of adventures as I kind of re reflect on it. And, and what did you major in uh, uh, in, in college? Yeah. So my undergrad was computer engineering. ECE is kind of a joint college anyway, but my undergrad was computer engineering. And then my uh, master's uh, research focused on uh, electrical engineering, digital signal processing. And then when I entered the professional environment, I immediately discovered machine learning, um, which eventually led me to artificial intelligence. So it's interesting how, you know, 
20 years, 20 some odd years ago, you could go through a whole degree without ever bumping into machine learning. I didn't discover machine learning until I got into my professional environment, but then I was kind of immediately hooked. And, you know, early in my career, uh, I wouldn't have dared say I was into artificial intelligence. Like, that's not what you said. You know, and you, you definitely didn't talk about neural networks at all if you wanted to get your research funded. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, as I advanced from, you know, machine learning for human systems, you know, kind of as decision support tools for humans um, to more robotics and autonomous systems, it naturally leads you to grander thoughts about artificial intelligence. You're creating an agent that's going to go out in the world and perceive and understand its environment and act on the basis of its own perception. Um, and in my case, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time developing technologies for underwater robots, autonomous underwater systems. And so, you know, this is not a clean laboratory setting. This is the ocean. Um, so you're creating something that has to go out there and, and fend for itself in, the, in, a, in an open environment. Um, and it naturally leads you to, to question, you know, grander questions about more robust and generalizable uh, forms of intelligence, which uh, it's been amazing to kind of have an opportunity to think more and more about as I advance in my career. Yeah, it's I mean, it, you, you and I probably were in school uh uh, at the same time, I, I think I'm a little bit older than you are, uh, but uh, like we we were in school in the 90s, I'm guessing. Um, yep. And yeah, you're totally right. Like when I was getting my PhD or working on my PhD, uh, I dropped out much to my uh, advisor's chagrin. Um, yeah, you know, like you are absolutely right. Like you just didn't mention neural networks uh, <laughs> if you uh, if you wanted to graduate and get your papers published. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's really amazing to see how much has changed just over the past 20 years and even accelerating over the past 10. So um, but I do want to go back for a minute and sort of chat about this interplay that must have existed between your professional career and your music career. Did, did they benefit each other? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And um, it was a interesting journey uh, to kind of discover the interplay. I would have said something like not so much at the very beginning of that journey. But I think the intersections kind of have presented themselves to me over time um, and have been uh, really uh, satisfying to see on the on the music side, you know, especially as an independent artist with a very low budget. You know, you had to really be convincing to convince people to work with you for little or no money, <laughs> right? Or at least up front. And so, you know, you have to develop the skill of, of creating a pitch for yourself, a story um, that, that uh, you know, people would, would sort of buy into, a vision for where you were going. And then as, uh, you know, the executive producer of an album, you're a project manager, you know, it needs a budget. It needs milestones. Uh, you know, you're going to have roles and responsibilities if you're ever going to get anything out into the world. And so you know, it's interesting aspects of, of those things obviously transcend uh, both. And then from a from a technology standpoint, um, you know, if you think about audio recording and, and you know, uh, audio engineering, it's engineering. <laughs> you know, it's it's frequency selective signal processing. It's 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 filters. It's it's gains and amplification and all kinds of things. And so I definitely think from a technology standpoint, from a project management standpoint, um, and I'd add another dimension too, just communications and storytelling uh, really transcend both. And so over time, again, you know, a lot of these intersections have sort of presented themselves. And, and I realized even without, you know, knowing it at the time that each was benefiting from the other. One of the things that's been fun about my music career is sort of figuring out how things happen and how things get done. So at one point, you know, it was just a curiosity, like, how do I get things into music and TV? Yep. Just another challenge, right? So what I discovered is that there's these agents, right? And they, um, you know, they bring opportunities. And so what you have is you have uh, movie editors, video editors. A lot of times they put these, they get to the end of their production, they have these reference songs in there. And so, you know, at, at some point they uh, in the blind side, they got to the end and there was a scene that they had 50 cents in the club. And they're like, well, we ain't paying the license this song. Right. So then they put out, you know, they put out the call like to, the, to all the agents. So my agent comes to me and they said, we need a replacement for 50 cents in the club. 
So I call my guy in Ohio and I'm like, okay, let's, you know, let's put something together. So I made two songs for them. Um, one was that thing. And it, you know, it's not really my voice. It's me yeah, replacing yeah. that song. Uh, you know, it's my physical voice, but not my voice as an artist, but it's still fun. And that one wound up in the blind side. The second one I made for that spot to replace the 50 Cent song um, was uh, one that actually wound up in 50 Cent's power a few years later. So that was it was the two things I made to replace 50 Cent in uh, in the reference That's soundtrack. Awesome. Yeah, so it's kind of a cool story. But no, I didn't meet 50 Cent or anything like that. It's fascinating that you said that. Like one of the one of the reasons. I, I try to explain this stuff. So I I love to I love to learn about stuff. And the process of learning for me is almost better than the the end product that I, you know, I end up making. And so like that whole idea about like figuring out how all of this craziness works behind the scenes, like that sounds so appealing. Like more appealing than the song itself. Uh um yeah, that's yeah, exactly right. That's that's the of fun. fun of it for sure. Yep. You know, it's sort of interesting. Do you ever feel that it's easier for people to um, engage with and maybe even have more curiosity about the music work that you've done versus the, you know, this machine learning work that you're doing? Yeah, g given that, you know, like everybody sort of understands music, right? Uh, like it's just something innate in us that like we are musical, we appreciate music, you know, to the degree of like being a fan of musical art forms and like fans of the people who create it. But like you don't really have that with technology in the same way. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So this was actually something I really worried about at the beginning of my career. And I have to confess I actively tried to keep my music out and, and work separate. And, and I was not very uh, forthcoming about the music side of what I was doing at work um, because I wanted to be taken seriously. Uh, you know, as a, as a technologist, um, I was already someone who was from an underrepresented demographic, you know, from, uh, from that standpoint, you know, being a, a, a black person, a black male in, you know, science and technology. So to add that dimension too, I was like, okay, let me just <laughs> focus on, you know, the science and the tech when I'm when I'm at work. But but even that um, over time, you know, I grew to realize that I could kind of bring my whole self and present both sides. But it was it was easier as I had a track record of scientific and, and technological accomplishments to back it up. It was hard when I was a blank slate coming out of college. So, you know, for better or worse, I'm not sure what the what the right and wrong of that was. But, you know, I did wind up, for example, if you go on YouTube you know, you'll find a clip of me doing a hip hop duo with the director of the Applied Physics Laboratory um, at one of the uh, all hands addresses. And so that was like the big coming out party at work <laughs> for for the hip hop side. You know, on the technology side, though, 20 years ago or, you know, 15 years ago, you say you're doing machine learning. People are like, oh, what's that? That sounds curious. Machines learn. I uh, never heard of that. Now it's a little different. You know, I, you know, people know what AI is. When you say you do AI machine learning, they're like, oh, tell me more. You know, I hear about this stuff all the time. Um, and that plus the fact that technology is forming such a profound substrate of our whole human experience now. Uh, I think people are just more naturally engaged and curious about technology because it's such a part of our lives. And so Whereas it started more so, you know, the the kind of arts and music was something that people relate to. Now, I, I don't necessarily see a difference, uh, you know, in terms of the the level to which people are engaged in these two things. So, I, you know, I, I think this whole notion of narrative, the thing that you were talking about a minute ago, was uh, really important. So, like, you just sort of got, uh, you know, in your musical career that you are telling stories and you sort of understood as a young professional that you had to tell a story about yourself. Um, and I think with technologies like machine learning, narrative is also really important because they're complicated. And if you if you go all the way to the bottom, uh, just in terms of how they're implemented, the complexity of these things is very high. But yeah, the narrative is really important because it's such an important technology and, and it is having such a profound impact on 
what the future is is looking like every day as it unfolds that people need to be able to understand how to engage with it to sort of like what do i think about this technology what do i think about policy about this technology what do i think about uh you know like my hopes and my fears for the future of this technology so how you know have you thought much about uh like you know the story of ai yeah absolutely and and maybe there's a couple of sides but well, there's many sides but maybe two sides i'll pick to explore there um one is absolutely the idea that AI is is taking us in a bold new direction as a society. And um, I think it's more important than ever that we can engage around these policy questions and really around the directions of AI, definitely outside of computer science and across disciplines. And so we do need to create narratives. Even more than that, I think we need to create directions um, that we agree on, uh, that we want to take this technology. A lot of times I think people are discussing AI as something separate from human beings and human intelligence. And I think we need to be thinking of these two things as complementary. So what are our goals for, for these things? You know, can we start to set some audacious goals around enabling as many people as possible on the planet to live a long, healthy life, creating an atmosphere of shared prosperity? And what is the role of AI in doing that? To me, these big societal narratives should be at the, at the top level of abstraction in terms of what we're talking about. And then everything else is derived from that. I think when we, if we're going to just let a thousand flowers bloom and see where we land on this thing, I think we could wind up with some really unintended consequences, you know, from that. Yeah, I really, really agree. Uh, and I think, you know, too, if you have the wrong narrative, you could have unintended consequences as well. Like one of the things that I have been telling people over and over again over the past handful of years is just sort of a useful uh, useful device about thinking about the future of AI is that AI, and, and like especially its embodiment in, in machine learning, is a tool. Uh, and just like any other tool that people have invented, uh, like it's a human-made thing and like humans use it to accomplish a whole wide variety of tasks. And, you know, the tool is going to be as good or as bad as the uses to which we put it. And, you know, it's just very, very important, I think, for us to, like, have a set of hopeful things that we're thinking about uh, for, you know, those uses of AI as, as you know, we, we have our anxieties. And both are important. Like, you have to, you, you, you know, it, it will certainly be used for, uh, for bad things. Um, but, you know, the, as with any technology, like the hope is that there will be orders of magnitude more positive things and, and good things that people will attempt to do with it than, than the bad. Uh, and part of how we get to that balance of good versus bad is the stories that we're telling ourselves right now about uh, what it's capable of and like what to be wary about. I think I think that's um, that's right on point. And. You know, we can even ask yourself, you know, what does it mean to behave intelligently as a species? Um, I actually think we're getting to the point where we can start asking ourselves and, and holding ourselves to, you know, to some standard there. Um, you know, if you just think about artificial intelligence at a low level, you know, from an agent standpoint, you know, I think intelligence itself is the ability to achieve goals, to set and achieve goals. And then what do you have to do? You have to be able to have some understanding of the world around you, um, you know, through some mechanisms of perception, whether that's kind of our human modalities or, or other kinds of modalities, you have to decide on a course of action, uh, you know, that best achieves your goals, and then you have to carry it out. Like, these are the things you do to be intelligent. So when you extrapolate that to, to us as a species, because one of the hallmarks of human intelligence is our social intelligence, our ability to, uh, you know, to collectively set, uh, pursue goals and things like that. So I think uh, and I'm, I'm sort of, as you can see, I'm sort of cursed now to see everything through the lens of intelligence and, and you know, artificial intelligence. This is just how I, I, my lens on the world. But I, I think it's, I think it's helpful. I think it's useful. I think in order to behave intelligently as a species, we have to do some of these things that you're talking about, setting some bold visions and directions and figuring out how to organize around those. Yeah. When I was a kid, the thing that 
really inspired me, I think, to become a scientist were the stories that I was reading. And, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and you had a whole mix of things. Like you had uh, you had a bunch of science fiction, or I, I read a bunch of science fiction that was uh, sort of techno-utopian. You know, it was these, these future worlds that had a bunch of technology, some of which now exists, uh, some of which will probably never exist. Uh, and, you know, sort of people living these crazy interesting lives uh you know like full of drama in these futuristic worlds and then you had some dystopian things as well um you know i always sort of think about uh like these two different portrayals of ai there's commander data from star trek the next generation and then there's the terminator uh you know from the terminator movies you know, the latter is sort of the, you know, the anxious depiction of AI, like what happens if you build machines that, uh, you know, get out of control. And the commander data you know, version of AI, I think is really, really interesting because I, I don't know whether you've watched the um, the Star Trek Picard uh, series, uh, which is the... Uh, the, the, the recent thing with Patrick Stewart and, uh, and, and like... Data, again, played this uh, very, very important role in the story that they were telling. And, like, the, the interesting thing about Data is even though he was an android, he was an artificial intelligence, um, he was always the thing that the writers in Star Trek used to shine a spotlight on humanity, so, like, he, you know, in some sense was, like, the most human character in the show. Uh, and, like, they sort of used his art- artificiality as this plot device to sort of explore uh, what our human nature is. And, like, I think that sort of gets to what you were just talking about. Like, I, I think, you know, AI may tell us an awful lot about uh, who we are. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. And I want to seize on the theme um, of dystopian thinking. Because you and I were, you know, talking previously about kind of the utopian thinking, you know, uh, setting goals. And I do think it's it's even, uh, you know, increasingly important to do that dystopian thinking, to do it in a way that's constructive, um, you know, coming from uh, kind of the federal science and technology space and, and, and advising, uh, you know, within the Department of Defense and those kinds of circles. Um, it's easy to get focused on. Uh, really uh, kind of hy- hyperbolic types of concerns um, like the Terminator and, and, and uh, Skynet and all those things. So I, I, I like us to do more dystopian thinking, but I do like us to also ask the right questions uh, to take that mirror, you know, and, and kind of reflect like you were saying with, with Commander Data. And if you think about the mirror, there's a, there's a series on Netflix that I love called Black Mirror. Yep. And so this is the reflection. I think these are the kinds of concerns we should really be thinking seriously about ways in which uh, people will use technologies, uh, you know, in, in a way that hurts people, you know, whether uh, through positive intent or negative intent. Uh, I love the kind of Twilight Zone-esque, you know, ways in which the best intentions or, or you know, uh, kind of uh, turn into unintended consequences uh, yeah. through things like uh you know, the Killer Bees episode, you know, as a, as a you know, kind of a cautionary tale on autonomous systems or uh, the episode where the brain computer interface that the, the, the gentleman is using kind of, um, you know, imprisons him in his own mind. I think these are I, those particular questions may not be the right one, but that way of thinking that, you know, the, the dystopian thinking, but but really asking the right questions, uh, I think, is uh, uh, important for us as we move forward. Yeah. It, it is a it's an interesting ethical dilemma, I think, thinking about where the line is between um, inaction uh, and yeah, sort of safeguarded action. Like the, the the safest thing to do in life is to you know sort of stay at home and don't come into contact with anyone else and uh, you know just you you can sort of surround yourself in this bubble of safety where you really can't do much and you can look at almost any 
substantial technology that we've ever built. And like, if you let your imagination run wild, you are going to be able to imagine like uh, a huge number of bad things that you can do with the technology. And if you let that imagination paralyze you and convince you not to build a technology at all, not to, you know, leave your house at the beginning of the day to engage with the rest of uh, the rest of humankind, like you miss out on, you know, these incredible things that, help us become more human, I think. And, you know, and then that solve like really, you know, important problems like, you know, that help us be healthier and live longer and like have, you know, much higher quality of life and, you know, that supports a larger population on the planet, you know, like, and, 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 like if you like just stripped away even the past 50 years worth of technological development, uh, like the world would be in a terrific amount of trouble which is something we we often often forget. You know, so like it's it's that framework that you use to decide on like how you balance uh um you know positive action versus inaction and like not get paralyzed uh like in one way or the other. I think it's right. Um I think you articulated uh the the trade space there very well. Um I I think and I, and I don't know the right answer. Like This is a, a trade I. space to be aware of and always uh, conscious of. I also think we need the right dose of humility about our understanding of the world and ourselves. We still have so much to learn, even about the ways that our own bodies and minds work, much less the very rich, interconnected ecological systems that we live inside of. You know, I was in, uh, I was actually moderating a panel at the National Academy of Sciences about uh, science communication and the communication around uncertainty uh, in science. And, you know, the discussion, I'm not an expert in this area, but the discussion was about um, genetic manipulation and, and doing things like uh, putting genetic manipulations out into populations of, of, say, insects or something to cause some population level change. And the idea of, of, making a change like that in an ecological system that's so interconnected, uh, you know, and the repercussions and the unintended consequences that could happen. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily the right or wrong thing to do, but certainly I think we need to approach it with the right dose of humility and, and to be humble as we explore that trade space that you just laid out there. Yeah. Look, I, th- I think the, that notion of humility is extraordinarily important for so many reasons. Maybe the, you know, one of the more important reasons we need to have humility is just that we we need to make sure that we're not drinking our own Kool-Aid, uh, so to speak, that we're not overconfident about what it is we think all of our technology and all of our science is telling us. One of the things that, you know, that I've tried to tried to push back on a lot over the past 12 months is, uh, you know, folks who are trying to take all of their incredible IQ and all of their incredible energy and apply it to, you know, helping with the pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's this horrible thing and we've got this tremendous sense of urgency. Um, and, Like, even though we have that urgency, like, I've tried really hard to help us uh, or to, like, encourage people to not uh, not throw away our scientific process. So, like, the scientific process is, like, so valuable because it's only allegiances to truth. And, like, that process of finding the truth is, like, incredibly messy. Um, and, And, like... Even when you think you found truth, like you probably haven't. Uh, and, you know, just sort of constantly reassessing like what you think you believe and, and like how you arrived at those beliefs is integral to the way science works. You know, and, and it's sort of unforgiving, right? Like if you insist dogmatically that this thing is true and, you know, like you, you just haven't used all of this you know, apparatus of scientific rigor that we built up over the centuries. Uh, you know, like it, it, things will spectacularly fail. So anyway, you know, I, I, like I think that humility, it's like, you know, like we, we really have to not, uh, 
not think that we understand more than we do. And like we, uh, you know, we certainly shouldn't be, uh, you know, sort of insisting that we've uh, found truths we really haven't, uh, we really haven't proved out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so, so important. Um, and, and maybe this is a great segue into aspects around diversity and inclusion, because yep. I do think that can really be a superpower for us if we leverage it. Um, because like you said, um, it's so messy, uh, you know, getting to, you know, getting from our subjective observations, even of experimental data, much less, you know, a world experience and everyone, even when you try to be unbiased, you, you bring all that inherent worldview into everything that you do. And in some of these cases, I think our only hope is to integrate over enough of those conflicting worldviews to try to triangulate on what is objectively true, or at least the, the closest we can get there. Um, and that's, you know, there's so many aspects of diversity to really be focused on, um, you know, uh, demographic diversity, et cetera, but you definitely need people that think differently, that have a different lived experience, et cetera. How do, you, how do we create pipelines of those folks into these fields? How do we create safe spaces for, for people to think differently and pursue their careers differently. There's just so many aspects, but I think if we get it wrong, we're dooming ourselves, I think, to, to the kinds of groupthink that happen when you have a lot of folks um, that, when, when you're not integrating, so to speak, over a lot of these differing yeah. uh, worldviews. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. Yeah, I, I think the things that I've seen be most successful over by, you know, couple of decades as a professional in technology have been places where you you have exactly what you said that diversity of experiences that diversity of perspectives that diversity of backgrounds uh and like a real diversity of thinking who knows how many wonderful things that you can dream up of or how many things you can as inspire in others because you are both a musician and an engineer and like having more of that uh like i think is just so valuable there are like infinite wonders uh, in in the world that we will never discover, which is uh, you know, like maybe one of those uh, you know sort of optimistic slash depressing things to say, and like we won't even get to you know like the interesting part of that infinity unless like everybody is bringing the best that they have to figuring out what the future is. Yeah, I think that's right, and. You know, even as our technology is advanced, et cetera, I think the kinds of global challenges that we have to step up to are getting greater and greater. Um, and if you take this, <laughs> you know, this this simulation that we're all kind of involved in and you fast, you know, you fast forward it enough years, you know, the statistically improbable things that we sort of are, are afraid of, you know, they, they come to, to fruition. And the pandemic is, you know, uh, uh, an illustration. So I do think we have to to figure this out, you know, and and, and get to the point where we're sort of activating our collective intelligence uh, yeah. in the best possible way. Yeah, and I and I think that you know, if you think about some of these things, like preventing the next pandemic or like making the impact of the next pandemic less than uh, you know less than everyone that came before them, or climate change or, uh, you know, sort of dealing with the demographic inversions that are happening in the industrialized world, you know, population growth is going to slow down in uh, the U.S. and uh, Europe and China, Japan and Korea, uh, like it will start to slow down in India and then it's going to start booming in Africa. And so, you know, the thing that we know is that, you know, population growth is the thing that, uh, you know, Im implies like the, the growth of ingenuity and creativity and whatnot. And so, you know, like how you can start investing now in Africa so that as that population uh, explodes over the coming decades, uh, like all of those energetic young people are going to be equipped to like help help all of us old folks uh, like figure out how to solve uh, some of the big, big challenges that we've got facing us. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I think that's that's absolutely right. And, you know, even 
again, I'm, I'm not an expert in everything that I'm curious about, but it also seems to me that a lot of our economic systems are sort of predicated on this notion of uh, an expanding population. Yep. <laughs> you know, there's some inter some interconnectedness there. And so, you know, as these as these population trends start to invert, like you're saying, we need to do some serious thinking about how our economic uh, markets and things allocate resources and, and all that. So there's some really uh, substantive and fundamental things I think we're going to need to be rethinking here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you mentioned like one of the you've mentioned a couple times, actually, uh, like one of the one of the things that we should with a tremendous amount of urgency be focusing on is like how you can use machine learning to help with uh, healthcare and aging. Um, you know, I, I read this article last year in the New York Times uh, about the um, elder care crisis in Maine, uh, where there just aren't enough people to help take care of the aging population there. And so like, it's not a, um, it's not a, wage thing or anything else like for no you no amount of money you can uh hire you know enough people to take care of uh all all of the elderly and you know this is going to play out everywhere soon Uh, you know i think in japan like they already are like seriously thinking about the technology that has to be built to help make sure that you know you can have the elderly living a dignified uh, life in their later years, uh, and like you still are able to pick up the slack and productivity in the population uh, because you have fewer workers than you've ever had before, uh, and like you you preserve the ability of what workers that you do have to be able to do their jobs uh, and like you know do the creative things that they're doing to, you know, build the future of those societies, uh, you know, without being completely consumed with taking care of their, you know, their parents and older relatives. Uh, And like the only thing that sorts that out is technology. Otherwise you just have a, you have a collapse in like the quality of life uh, because there just aren't enough people to do all of the work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, And then there, I think we have a really amazing opportunity in automation and autonomous systems uh, where AI and robotics meet, you know, the ability to ingest data and do analysis, make decisions, but also to carry those decisions out, whether they're in, you know, we have a lot of automation emerging in factory settings and controlled environments. But, you know, I think a lot of the challenge, you know, comes in these more open environments, these less structured environments, environments with, with people and really making robotics and automation work uh, in those kinds of settings. And I just love to see more and more people, uh, more and more of our intellectual capacity thinking about some of those challenges uh, in a human-centered way. Yeah, I uh, could not agree more. So um, we're almost up on time here. And so I I think the last thing I I like to ask everyone is uh, what, you do for fun or in your spare time? It's sort of a weird question because I think almost everyone I chat with uh, like thinks that their work is fun and they don't have much spare time. But I, I asked the question anyway. <laughs> well, I, so I'm definitely one of those folks. I'm definitely one of those people that thinks my work is fun. Um, but uh, I love being a father. I love hanging out with my kids. And, um, you know, in pandemic times, it's been all about <laughs> video games and uh, virtual social experiences through video game platforms have been just the thing that, uh, you know, has kept the social fabric together, you know, among our kids and their friend circles and everything. So I'm someone who's who grew up on video games and, you know, had a Nintendo, you know, and an Atari and all those things. So I love games uh, and, and then just kind of getting into whatever my kids are into, you know, in general, which right now is these kind of virtual games, which I don't, I'll be honest with you, the, those kinds of platforms I'm not so crazy about, but I love uh, spending time with my kids. So I kind of just, again, make a point to kind of get into whatever they're into. So what are your uh, what are your kids' uh, favorites? Oh, man. Uh, they're into Roblox right now. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, Adopt Me is like a game in, in Roblox yep. and, and Piggy. I don't know if you've seen this. Yep. Uh, you, you know, so it, it's those things. And it's like, OK, well, I guess I have to. To, to get into these things, to spend time with them. Sometimes I, I, I can't come into their room. I have to come into the virtual server to, yeah. to, to see them. Uh, but I sometimes try to pull them back towards more console-oriented games too because that's kind of my sweet spot. But 
Yeah, it's really it's really fascinating. Like my, uh, I've got a ten year old and a twelve year old, and the ten year old is like a legit Roblox tycoon. You know, he's learning all sorts of stuff about economics, and uh, you know, like he he has this facility with virtual worlds that will go with him his rest of his life. It's really fascinating to hear that your kids are into that too. It's an interesting shift. Yeah, and a sign in the times for sure. Well, thank you so much, Ashley, for taking time to chat with us today. And I, uh, like, I'm so glad that you're here at Microsoft and and just can't wait to uh, be able to work more with you over the coming years. Likewise, Kevin. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Had a lot of fun today. Awesome. Well, that was Kevin's conversation with Ashley Lawrence. And I was so fascinated by everything that you talked about. First of all, he is brilliant. And as you were kind of saying at the top of the show, it's really rare that you see someone who has achieved kind of parallel careers in two very different fields. Not that there might not be, as you said, kind of a mysterious connection uh, between music and between computer science, but they are on the face of it, how they work, very, very different. I, I think that's just so stunning that someone like Ashley exists, honestly. Yeah, it's so great to see him have the success that he's had in both of these things that he has passion about. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of us get pushed into one direction or the other fairly early in our career. Like I know you, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. like you are... Uh, you're a computer programmer and you are uh, a writer and a journalist. Uh, and like those are also two things that look very different from one another on the surface. And I'm guessing that through your career, and I'm guessing Ashley had this as well, and like I've had my own experience with it, like you get encouraged to like, oh, you got to focus, you got to focus, you got to pick one thing. And yeah. like, I always love seeing people like Ashley, where it's like, no, I actually don't have to pick one thing. I, I'm going to do both. No, I totally agree. And you're exactly right. I think most of us, we do have one thing that we have, we either have to pick or we have to focus more on. And I love that he's had these parallel careers, but it was really also interesting to me hearing him talk about how at the beginning, he tried to keep, you know, his music life separate from his technology work because he wanted to be taken seriously. And I'm glad he doesn't have to do that anymore, that he can share his full self. But it also makes me think, okay, in technology, people really need to be a lot more open-minded about the different backgrounds and interests that people have. Oh, I could not agree with that more. Uh, and like when he said that, it really, really, really resonated with me because, um, you know, a little bit of it, I'm guessing, is imposter syndrome and, uh, you know, you sort of feeling very uncomfortable early in your career about whether or not you belong in the, yeah. the, the place that you've chosen to be. And like part of it is like legitimately the, these professions like have these notions of, you know, this is what it means to be a blah. Uh, and, and it's, you know, whether it's a yeah, medical doctor, a lawyer, a computer scientist, uh, academic, uh, a programmer at a tech company. Um, and the reality is, like, if we were just much more open about uh, about things uh, and encourage people to be their authentic selves early, early on and, like, help them understand that, like, we all feel like imposters at some point or the other, that, uh, like, maybe we would – you know, we, we'd have more people doing more interesting things. For sure. And I mean, I think it also, and this is really evident in the work that Ashley does, it's so important in AI to have different perspectives. And I think that's why it's amazing that we have someone like him who is an expert in that area who also has different perspectives than other people might, you know, who've come into this because of his curiosity that he was talking about that he's had since he was a kid. I have a feeling that you would need to be curious to be able to do the things that he does. You, you need to have that sense of asking why and wanting to learn more. And I love that. Yeah, for sure. And, and I agree. Like it is critically important in technology in general and particularly with AI, like these things that are going to have uh, a high degree of influence over what the future looks like. You just really need 
a diverse set of people helping you build those things um, just because the technology itself has so much impact. Like you want it to be in the hands of as many people as humanly possible. For sure. For sure. Well, I loved the conversation and I can't wait to see what, what Ashley does now that he's at Microsoft. Yeah, me too. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much to Ashley for joining us today. And send us a message anytime at behindthetech at microsoft.com and be sure to keep listening. See you next time.